Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight on Refuel. This is our midweek Bible study here at Crossfire Worship Center, and I'm so glad that you join me tonight because we're going to continue in our study in the book of Revelation. Well, tonight we are coming up to a new section here in this book. It's going to go from chapter 15, verse 1, to chapter 16 and verse 21. Now we've gotten to the point where we're going to begin to deal with the seven vile judgments or the seven bull judgments. Now, uh, the first half of the tribulation, as we've already seen, has been full of judgment. We've seen the seven seals opened and the judgments that uh, went forth as a result of those seals being opened. We've seen then that it followed into the seven trumpet judgments. And the last thing that we've seen was that the seventh trumpet had been opened. But as that seventh trumpet was opened and blasted, we didn't see the immediate judgment that came as a result of that. But instead, what we've seen is that we were shown an overall picture of the last days. And so... In that picture, what was revealed to us is we were given this image, this picture of this woman with the 12 stars, and uh, she was pregnant with child. And what we came to understand was that it was the nation of Israel, uh, which was going to give birth to the Messiah. And right from there, we were introduced to the dragon who, had, with his tail, had swept a third of the stars, who we believe that are the angels who threw their lot in with him and who rebelled against God uh, with Satan. And we see how he comes against the woman and her child. Now, of course, again, the woman is the nation of Israel, so Satan comes against them to persecute them. And we also see how he has tried several times to present, prevent the Messiah from coming to this earth. And so he's tried to prevent Jesus Christ from coming. And we looked at the ways in which he did that. But it also refers to the tribulation period, because through the tribulation period, Satan is going to be persecuting the nation of Israel. And so we've seen how he was going to come against the nation of Israel during those days, that time, that future time in the tribulation period, and how God will protect Israel. And because of his protection over Israel, Satan is full of fury, he's full of wrath, and he sets out to go and find more of God's people to persecute. And so then it leads into this introduction into the first beast and into the second beast. And of course, that is the Antichrist, and it is the false prophet who is the sidekick to the Antichrist. And so what we're seeing at that point, because you have to understand, we've come into the second half of the tribulation period now, going into this last three and a half years, the Antichrist is now revealing himself for who he truly is. In the first part of the book of Revelation, we've seen that he comes in as a man of peace. But now, as we reach the second half, now he's revealing himself for who he truly is. He's this one world leader, and he's demanding that all people worship him, and he's coming against God's people, he's persecuting God's people. And then the sidekick of his, this religious leader, the false prophet, is now introducing a mark that people must receive on their right hand or on their forehead, which gives allegiance to the beast. And if they don't accept this mark, they can't buy or sell. And so what he also does is then he just he erects this statue or this image of the beast, and all people must worship this image. So if they don't receive the mark and if they don't worship this image, then what happens to these people is they're shut out of the system, but also uh, they are going to be killed for not giving their uh, allegiance to the Antichrist, okay? And so as a result of all this, all the persecution that, that, that's coming against God's people and their rejection of God and their rejection of his son, and because they're giving allegiance to the beast and worshiping the beast, what we've seen in the last part of this, in the last lesson, was that there is going to be this great harvest of the earth. Now again, that harvest does not refer to a harvest of lost souls where we're winning people for Christ through the preaching of the gospel. I know that's what we automatically think when we talk about a harvest. But this harvest is the judgment of God, the judgment of God being poured out on this earth. Because one thing we know is that the Antichrist is going to lead his armies, all those who join with him, to come against the nation of Israel and to try and wipe her off the face of the earth. And what is going to happen is Jesus Christ is going to return and he's going to destroy 
the Antichrist and all his armies and all those who are joined with him. And now we know that that is this, this war of Armageddon where this great harvest is going to take place. Uh, we may talk more about the war of Armageddon, but I believe it's a campaign. It's this, this series of wars that will take place in the last half of the tribulation period leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ. But the bloodshed is going to be so great that it's going to run for 200 miles to the height of the horse's bridle. Now, that might be some hyperbole, but what it is speaking of is it's speaking of the mass amount of death and bloodshed that is going to take place in those days. So this leads us up to today's lesson. Now, today's lesson we are looking at, of course, chapter 15, and we're looking at verses 1 to 8. So it's just a shorter chapter. But what we're seeing here now is the prelude to the judgments, the seven bold judgments that are going to be poured out. As we get into chapter 16 in our study, that's when we will see those seven bold judgments poured out. And these judgments are going to be greater than, than all the other judgments, okay? So we begin with verse 1. Verse 1, it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So John sees another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. And so what does he see? He sees seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last of the judgments of God. And once these are finished, the wrath of God is finished. So this is the last series of judgments that's going to take place. Uh, during the tribulation period, and then the wrath of God, the judgment of God is done. Jesus Christ will return, and then he'll establish his kingdom. And so there is a set time that God will pour his judgment out on this unbelieving, sinful world, and it is the seven-year tribulation period. I know there are so many people who wonder, why does God let all this stuff go on? Why, why doesn't he come and, and judge the earth now? Because he has a set time to judge the earth. You know, right now, the time that we're living into or living in is referred to the dispensation of the church or of grace, okay? And so what is happening now is that Jesus Christ, he's building his church and he's commissioning his church to go throughout the world with the gospel. And then he says, once that is complete, once the gospel's gone into all the world, then the end will come, okay? But right now is still the age of grace right now. God is reaching out to lost sinners. God doesn't desire that any would perish, but that all would repent and come to faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want to pour out his judgments, but the fact is there are people who will continue to rebel. There are people who will continue to, to do evil. There will be people who will refuse to accept his son. And so that judgment is going to come. But there is a set time for this, okay? And so we have to realize that even though God is patient right now, God is merciful, and that it's, you know, that hourglass. You know, you ever seen an hourglass uh, with full of sand? You know, it begins to run out. And, and time is running out. We're coming to the end. That judgment is about to come upon the earth. And God is calling people right now to be saved, to be reconciled to him by putting faith in his son. He doesn't want to pull, pour out his judgment on people. Today's the, Today's the day of salvation. People must believe in Jesus Christ and be saved today. You know, we always say that God is love, and we know that he really is. God loved the world, that he, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So you see how loving God is, and then the fact that he would give his son, his son would come and give his life for you and pay the penalty of your sin. But here's what you need to understand. Yes, God is loving, but God is also just. He must carry out his justice on this earth, and so his judgment must come against those who sin, who rebel, who do evil, who reject his son, and that he will do. And so what must the people of the earth do? Matthew 3, 2. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We must repent. We must turn away from our sins. We must turn away from our sinful ways and put faith towards God. We must turn away from that lifestyle. You see, the kingdom is about to come. There is a seven-year period of time where those judges will be poured out. Right after that, 
Jesus will set up his kingdom. So the kingdom is so near. And so what must people do is they must repent and get right with God. Luke 13 and verse 3, he says, I tell you, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You see, there's only one way to escape the wrath and the judgment of God, and that is to repent and put faith in him, put faith in his son, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be forgiven, and you'll have a right standing before God. So one must repent. If they refuse to repent and refuse to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will perish, okay? And we're going to see in a minute why, why that would happen, okay? But let's go to verses 2 to 4 right now. In verses 2 to 4, what do we see? We see the victorious saints in heaven in verses 2 to 4. And it says, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God and they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God. The Almighty, the righteous, and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. So here again, we see the victorious saints in heaven. These saints in heaven, they have come out of the tribulation period, and it says that they have overcome or conquered the beast, its image, the number of its name. But if they're in heaven, so these ones are in heaven now. They've been taken before the Lord. Now, if they're in heaven, that means that they have given their lives. They have been martyred for their faith. Now, we have seen this all throughout this book, throughout the study of this, that the saints will be martyred, that they will be beheaded, they will be tracked down, and they will be killed. Well, here's these, this group of martyred saints now who is in heaven before God, and they're singing this song of victory. And I just love how it puts it here, that it is that these ones who are there, these are the ones who had been victorious over the beast, his image, and the number of his name, okay? They were victorious. Well, you might ask, so how, how were they victorious? How did they, they overcome if, if they have died and now they are before the Lord? Well, they overcame the beast and his system by not accepting his mark and by not worshiping his image, by standing for their faith and their allegiance to Christ even unto death. You see, in that day, there will be so much pressure on people to accept that mark, to worship the Antichrist, to become a part of his system, to accept him and give allegiance to him. Because what will happen is that you, you will be able to function in society. You'll continue to be able to buy and sell. You'll continue to work and be paid and be able to purchase. Okay, But anybody who doesn't, they're going to be shut out of the whole system. Okay? Now, we're starting to see a little bit of that already in our society. I mean, when we're, we're, when we're talking about this pandemic and we're talking about vaccines, what are we starting to hear already? We're starting to hear about people, they're starting to, to encourage people to only hire those who are vaccinated, um, and only the vaccinated can go to certain places and do certain things. So it's not hard to believe or see that this would actually take place in the future because we're already beginning to see this in our world, okay? So people will be shut out and the pressure is going to be so great. Think about people who have children who they have to feed. I mean, you know, you're going to be so concerned for your children and there'll be such pressure to receive this. But as I always say, this is when we, we really need to learn how to walk by faith. We need to really learn how to trust the Lord. And Matthew 6.33 says that if we put the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, that he will take care of all our needs. Now, we're going to have to be able to stand on the word of God, believe God for our needs to be met. Those who are in this tribulation period time, especially who are going to face this type of persecution, they are going to have to really trust in the Lord. And these ones who we are seeing in heaven right now singing this song of victory, 
They overcame. They gave their lives, though, for Christ, but they did not give themselves to the beast system. They did not receive the mark. They refused the mark. They did not worship him and his image. And they stood for their faith. They stood for what they believed. They gave their allegiance to Jesus Christ right till the end. And now what has happened is they have been rewarded. Listen, when a believer gives their life for the cause of Christ, it is not defeat. The devil didn't win. I've heard believers say that before. When a saint has died and a saint, you know, something has happened to them. Oh, how did, why did God let the devil win? Why do you think he let the devil win? They've gone and received their reward. You know, the devil doesn't win. These people here in the tribulation, the devil didn't get victory over them. They are the ones who are saying, you know, the word of God says they were victorious. They overcame. You see, they remain strong until the end, and they have now received their reward, and they're singing a song of victory. You know, Paul, when he was in prison, Paul, he didn't know if he was coming to his end. It was possible that he was going to be uh, killed for his faith now and for the proclamation of the gospel now. But what did Paul say? He said that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, so to live is Christ. So if I go on living, I live this life for Christ and I continue to serve him. But if I die, it is gain. Why? Because I go to be with Christ. I receive my reward. I'm going to be in his presence. And so what did he say? It's far better to be with Christ than to live on. And then he goes on, he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we see that right here with these saints. They are absent from their bodies, and where are they? They're right in the presence of the Lord in heaven, singing this song of victory. You see, you don't have to fear death. You see, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? No, we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Death has no sting. It has no power over us any longer. We are going to live forever. We may not live forever in these bodies, physically here on this earth, but there's, we're going to leave these bodies and we're going to go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to be with him forever, okay? We have eternal life. Those who put faith in Jesus Christ have eternal life. We don't have to fear death. No, once we leave this, we close our eyes here, we'll open them up in the presence of the Lord, and we're going to receive our reward. And it is far greater than anything that this world has to offer us. And we need to understand that, okay? That's what we have to understand. That is our hope. That's what we look to. That's why we don't cling on to everything in this world. We don't cling on to this life. Okay, if we die for the faith, then we'll be rewarded. We got something better awaiting us. You know, if things turn bad and things in this world don't go the way we want it, you know, lockdowns and all this kind of stuff, and, you know, we just don't like the way society's going, and if it's coming hostile towards Christianity, rejoice, because our redemption draws nigh. It means that Jesus is returning soon, and we need to get excited about that. Listen, we're here for one reason, and that is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to carry out the commission that he gave us. And once we get focused on that, none of these things will bother us. <laughs> and... Once we get focused on that and do that work, we're storing up riches. We're storing up reward for ourselves in heaven, and we're going to be with Christ forever. And we have to remember that, you know, we're not going to be in heaven forever because Jesus Christ is going to return, and we're going to return with him. He's going to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years, and the Bible says that we are going to rule and reign with him on this earth earth. So he's got work for us to do. Some of us are going to be, we're going to be leaders over areas over this world. Acting as his, again, is his, it'll be his government on this earth. And so we're going to help to, to usher in that government. Okay. And we're going to, so he's going to have work for us to do. And so there's a lot to look forward to for the Christian, but there's no victory for Satan in the death of the saints. There's victory for the saint. And so these ones are in heaven now. They're rejoicing because they, came, they overcame the beast system. Even though they gave their lives to the end, they received this great reward. And so, again, we know that the Antichrist 
is at, the, at this midpoint going to receive, reveal himself for who he truly is. He's going to demand that all people worship him, do away with all other religions, and demand that all people worship him or die. And so what he's going to do at this time, he's going to launch the worst holocaust that the world has ever seen. He'll go after Jews and Christians with the intent to kill. But those who stand with Christ will be with Christ. Understand that those who stand with Christ will be with Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, he said, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Amen. Well, these ones who are in heaven, they did not deny Lord Jesus Christ. They took a stand for him, and therefore they are with him. Jesus did not deny them before his Father, but they entered into the kingdom. So we must stand for the faith and not deny Christ, but stand for Christ. And if we don't deny him here, then he won't deny us before his Father who is in heaven. Amen. So these believers are seen in heaven standing beside the sea of glass with harps in their hands. Now this sea of glass is different from the sea of glass that we've seen in chapter 4. Because if you notice with this sea of glass, it's mingled with fire. Okay, now this could mean one of two things. First, it could refer to them coming out of the fire of the tribulation period. Okay, uh, it's going to be a tough time. We know that. We just seen that, and how persecution will come. There'll be great pressures upon the people of God. Secondly, it could refer to the judgment that is about to be poured out on the earth through the bowl judgments. Okay, and that could be very well what it is speaking about because these judgments are about to be poured out. And so the next thing we see in verse 4 is we see the great songs that they sang, the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, and they sang those in, in victory. Okay, so let's move on to verses 5 through, through 8. Now there it says, after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and the seven angels who had seven plagues, they came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Okay, so here what we see is we see that the judgment of God is being sent forth. These judgments, these angels are coming now and about to pour out these bold judgments. And what we see is that the sanctuary of the tabernacle in heaven was opened up. And we have seen this before in this book. We've seen that there is this temple that is in heaven. And in fact, the, the design of the tabernacle that was given to Moses uh, was a copy of the one in heaven. Uh, if you turn with me just over to Hebrews, and you look in Hebrews chapter 8, and you'll see how Hebrews will talk about this tabernacle that is in heaven. In verse 2 of Hebrews 8, it says, uh, A minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Speaking of that one in heaven, in verse 5, Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for for C, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. So everything that he had made and that was given to him was a pattern of the one that was given to him in heaven. In chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, it says, Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay? And then you could also go into Revelation 15 and verse 5, and you can see how this heavenly tabernacle is mentioned again. So the one that we've seen on earth was a copy of the one that is actually in heaven. So there is this sanctuary in heaven. Now the sanctuary, um, or this tabernacle, this temple in heaven, but now the sanctuaries, he's talking about this 
it here is speaking of the most holy place in the tabernacle, which is that part of the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant would sit. Okay, so this is the most holy place. This is the place where the presence of God would rest. Okay, now in the earthly tabernacle, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, he would go in there and he would pour the blood of the sacrifice on the bowl that sat on top of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Now we know the Ark of the Covenant was this box-like structure. It had a bowl on its lid, okay, and there were two cherubim that were on the lid. Now inside that, um, in, inside the Ark of the Covenant was the the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, okay? And so the Ten Commandments that sat inside the ark, uh, these commandments are the very thing that condemned man and put man under God's judgment. And so the law testifies, okay, that every man is guilty of breaking it and that is worthy of its punishment. And of course, what is that punishment? That punishment is death. The law only condemned man. It did not, it showed man what God's righteous standard was. It, it revealed to man what the penalty was for breaking it, but it didn't help man live for it or help man obey it, empower man to obey it, but rather we learn from Paul in Romans 7 that it actually empowered sin, okay? So because God is merciful, loving and full of grace, the high priest would once a year pour the blood of the sacrifice over the lid of the Ark of the Covering and atone for the sins of Israel. So he would come in, he would take that, that yearly sacrifice, okay, and he would pour it on that bowl and would act as a covering for the sins of the people. Okay, now when God would look down, he would see the blood and he wouldn't see the law which condemned man. He would see the blood. So this is why the blood acts as a covering, okay? And what happens is then uh, this would prevent God's judgment from coming upon the sinner and uh, therefore they wouldn't experience God's wrath. They wouldn't experience God's judgment against them, okay? They wouldn't be killed for, for their sins. And so now what we have to understand as well is that God wasn't satisfied with the, with the, the blood of bulls and goats. And those sacrifices, they, these ones would have to be repeated every year. But these sacrifices, they were only a type or they were only a shadow of the one that was to come. It was a type or a shadow of the sacrifice of Christ. It was teaching the people of Israel that there would be a sacrifice for their sins, that blood had to be shed for their sins, to make atonement for their sin. But God wasn't satisfied with the blood of bulls and goats, okay? So God would in the future send his lamb. He would send the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what John said in 1 John 1, 29, when he sees Jesus coming, John's with his disciples, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the blood of Jesus wouldn't just act as a covering. The blood of Jesus actually removes sin. It washes the person from sin. It justifies the person. It puts a person in, in right standing with God. And therefore, the law has nothing against them. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. They're not under his judgment any longer because they have a right standing. And so this was all a type of the Lord Jesus Christ who had shed his blood for the sacrifice and uh, for the sins of the people. Okay? Now, his sacrifice was a one-time sacrifice. It was never having to be offered again. Because why? God was fully satisfied and he accepted the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the people. So he wasn't satisfied with the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats, but he's satisfied with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This fully satisfied Find God. Now, Jesus came and he died for the world that whoever believes in him is not going to perish, but they're going to have eternal life. Now, notice that Jesus died for the whole world, but it's only those who believe in him who will be saved. It's only those who believe in him who will have everlasting life. It's only those who believe in him who will escape the judgment of God and the wrath of God. So one has to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to accept his sacrifice on your behalf. It's the only thing that saves you. It's the only way to receive the forgiveness of sins. It's the only way to be reconciled reconciled and brought into a right relationship with God where you're no longer under his judgment. 
You see, if you reject him, if you reject Jesus Christ, you reject the sacrifice. And you reject the only means to be saved and the only means to have a right standing before God. You reject him and there remains no sacrifice for you. And that leaves you under the judgment of God. See, all of these that are about to experience this judgment. Now look at, listen to this. Now the earth is about to experience the judgment of God. These angels are coming out of this sanctuary, okay? And they're coming out with these plagues. And the four living creatures who are before the throne of God are giving them the bowls of these judgments to pour out on the earth. Now, who is it that is going that these judgments are going to be poured out? It's going to be poured out on an unbelieving, Christ-rejecting world. A world that has rejected the sacrifice. The world that has rejected the Lamb of God. The world that has come against God's people and persecuted His people. They have rejected the mercy of God. They've rejected the grace of God. They've rejected the love of God. And now there's only one thing left for them, which is judgment. And so this judgment is going to come against these people. And so in verse 8, what do we see? In verse 8, now that these angels fly to the sanctuary, they come with the plagues, the four living creatures give them the bowl, and they're about to pour these bowls out. What does it say? Verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So this is revealing to us the intensity of these last seven plagues. And we're going to see the power of God poured out in these judgments on an unbelieving world. Next week, we're going to look at those seven plagues. We're going to look at those seven bull judgments being poured out on the earth. But listen, God reveals these things in advance to us in order that we would not be ignorant about, of what is about to happen. He, he reveals these things to us that we would be prepared and that we would get, be ready for His coming. That we would get right with Jesus Christ. We would get right with Him by accepting His Son, accepting the sacrifice. He's just giving us more time right now to repent and be saved. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you repented of your sins? Have you accepted his sacrifice on your behalf? That is the only thing that will keep you from the judgment of God and the wrath of God that is about to come on this earth. It's only by accepting Jesus Christ that you will be brought into a right relationship with God and that you will enter his kingdom and be with him forever. Because everyone who believes on him will have everlasting life. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, I pray that you would today. And all you have to do is cry out to God and say, Lord, save me a sinner. I repent of my sin. Now to repent of your sin means you're turning away from it. You're turning away from your life that is separated from God. And now you're going to live your life in faith toward God. It means you're going to live your life according to His Word, according to His will, and according to His plan, not your own. And you're going to accept the blood of Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for your sins. You believe that He died for you. So you come to God. Lord, save me a sinner. I repent of my sin. I put faith in Jesus Christ today. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead. And Lord God, I ask you to save me today. Change me. And I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You say a prayer like that, you cry out to God and you really mean it, you will be saved. Now begin to live your life for God. Begin to pray with him. Talk with him every day. Get yourself a Bible. Get into the Word of God. There's many apps online. You can get them on your phone, your tablet, whatever. But the Word of God is available. And then get yourself into a good Bible-believing church. Amen. Well, I pray that this message was a blessing to you today. I pray that you learned something. 
Uh, and I pray that you'll join me again next week as we get into chapter 16 and we'll begin to see these bold judgments poured out. Until then, God bless you.